up, but anyway, that's different. And we're live. This is John Reed, Enterprise Hits and Misses, video debut of Josh Greenbaum. How are we doing? I'm good, thanks. Uh, nice day. Um, it's Friday. You know, good good yeah. to chat with you. Yeah, we've got a little happy hour action going here, which is great. Uh, there's a few auspicious things about this occasion. And by the way, if anyone has been wondering, where are John's female guests? They're coming. They're coming. They have just proven a little hard to nail down lately. I don't know why. But that's going to get solved. Hard to get, John. Sorry. It it does happen, uh, but um, this is also uh, yes. I have a new microphone. I'm still fine tuning it. Let's not talk about that. It doesn't matter. You can hear me. <laughs> Hi, Thomas. Great. Hi, Thomas. Welcome to the show. I know you'll have some good comments on this one. And guess what, folks? This is also a new a debut of a new show format that I'm going to use sometimes. Um, this is not the countdown format. So surprise, surprise. This is different. This I, I don't know what I'm going to call it yet. It's either going to be like blogs that matter or blogs you should have read instead of wasting time on Facebook, you moron, or um, blogs that advance the conversation or something like that. But um, Josh, for a few years now, you've had a very productive, what, what my high school uh, history teacher called bone of contention, uh, <laughs> which I love that phrase. You've had a bone of contention around a few topics that that, that coalesce around this notion of extreme heterogeneity, heterogeneity, if I can pronounce it right. Heterogeneity. And thank you. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to get that right by the end of this broadcast. Got it. And why, and why that's such a problem for customers and the way that vendors approach it uh, essentially with their heads in the sand. And so we're going to talk about that today. And, and this goes back to a couple of posts you've done, and I'm going to be putting them into the chat as well. Um, you started, uh, well, you have may have more on this theme, but you had a really good one on LinkedIn about the myths of account control, which is another big factor here. And then earlier this year, you wrote a very interesting post on customer success, vendor empathy, and the problem of extreme heterogeneity. So, so tell so tell us, Josh, like what is 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 driving these posts? Well, what's driving these posts is really, I think, the head in the sand is sort of a good metaphor. Then, you know, one of my aphorisms is the biggest mistake, and it's in there. The biggest mistake vendors often make is that they try to sell product the way they develop it, not the way it's consumed by the customer. Right. And the sort of extreme version of that is it comes out of the sweet vendor who's got, you know, good ERP plus lots of other LOB. And their, their ticket to digital transformation, to innovation, to everything is a one-way ticket through their products and nothing else. And so, you know, you right. want to be modern and new and, you know, all that good stuff, just just buy one of everything from us and, you know, move, move everything out. Move the old stuff out, move the new stuff in. And, of course, that just doesn't wash with most large enterprises. There is no such thing as, I shouldn't say no such thing, it's very rare that a company is going to go wall-to-wall -wall with one vendor. In fact, it's extremely rare. What's more often the case is that there's just this big, you know, hodgepodge of technology, products, infrastructure, and advocates and influencers for all those individual pieces. And that's realities. That's how it is. That's the heterogeneity, the extreme heterogeneity of the market. Um, if you're not talking to that, if you're not helping customers with that, if you're not acknowledging that's the lives they live, then you're really not on the customer side. You're just on, you know, on your investor side, I hate to say it more than your customers. That's the wrong wrong way to go about it, in my view. Yeah, and I think you make a really important point too, which is as you move up market, this problem gets worse. Which is not to say that that there aren't some complex mid sized and smaller companies that run into the same issue. But in in your in the piece I put in the chat, you talk about this this extreme heterogeneity um, is more the norm than the exception. Uh, particularly among companies with annual revenues at top a billion, these companies may have at one point a standardized set of or uh, suite or best of breed applications. But as to your point, they merged and acquired, they divested, they reinvested, <laughs> they reorganized, and the standardization of IT just went out the friggin' window. Yeah, and business process, and 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 I mean, there's yes. Um, by the way, John, I've just had recently two conversations. Um, one with. Uh, uh, with uh, Reiner Zeno over at SAP, who runs the, their mid-market practice. And then I talked this morning with Unit 4, who's obviously more of a mid-market company as well. I, I'll correct myself. It's not necessarily just a large enterprise problem. Both of these mm -hmm. folks, we, we talked extensively about the heterogeneity. 
in the yeah. mid market as well. It's of course scaled down, but as we right. all know, that's that's the mid market. Smaller problems, but the scope and the breadth of the problems often are very similar. Yeah, I think I just made the point because I, I do run into some smaller companies that are able to successfully run their enterprise on like one suite of products yeah. and stuff. But 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 things get complex like sooner than you think. I think that's one of the ways of looking at this. And um, I want to go back to your to your original LinkedIn post on this, as because what we're going to do, audience, and you can chime in anytime with your questions and comments on this on this. I think very pivotal issue for customers. We're going to walk through some of the thinking behind it. So essentially, we're going to dwell on the problem for a while, and then we're going to move into like some things on what what can be done about it. And Greg, Greg, you know all about this. Greg uh, works for a major ERP customer. Uh, vendors do a poor job of showing how heterogeneity or heterogeneity or complexity provides value. Um, yeah, or how they can work within that context. I mean, one of the things Josh and I were talking about off camera is how few vendors voluntarily show their their integrations with other preferred uh, products that may be from their competitors. Uh, Thomas wants to ask if complexity does add value. Um, whoops, sorry, wrong comment. Um, and that's a little bit of a side discussion we can get into. Um, and uh, I, I mean, the first answer, answer it, Thomas, is it can <laughs> if you, if you play, you know, because your alternative is that complexity, you know, runs you into the ground. So, but yeah. Well, I, I would I would say that customers are certainly insulted when when they're told to run simple when they know they have a complicated business. Um, so so we know that just from history. Uh, right. But um, but but then there's some levels of complexity that I think are, are truly the enemy of of good processes. I want to read something from your LinkedIn post um, uh, that you, you published a couple of years ago. You said, ironically, hyperscalers are more like the on-prem on-prem vendors than cloud native vendors. So you take a shot at the hyperscalers too, and I think that's important because a lot of these problems do end up offloaded into cloud workloads, and none of them seem to acknowledge that that same issue despite the myriad apps that run in the clouds by individual customers um, or other hyperscalers. And you say, go ask your hyperscaler to provide a single pane of glass to manage that uh, diverse portfolio they're running in the cloud. And after they blink a few times, they'll most likely shrug. Ask them to help manage integrated workloads running on other hyperscalers and they'll scoff as well. And what you go on to say, which I think is a really important point, is that this lack of focus on heterogeneity demonstrates a remarkable lack of empathy on the part of these vendors. So say more about all of that. You know, it's, it's, it, what can I say? It's, it's, you know, who, who, whose interests are you really there for? And, and if, and if you're not really as a vendor, if you're not trying to make stuff work, your stuff work, despite heterogeneity or within the context of heterogeneity, then you're really not listening to what the customer's problem is. And, you know, particularly as we move into an era where, you know, the term end-to-end -end process or, um, you know, or, or digitally transforming core processes becomes, becomes a norm. Um, if you as a vendor don't consider the fact that maybe your customer, whatever you're doing, whatever brilliant thing you do in ERP, whatever brilliant thing you can do in your core, if you think the customer is going to, drop a you know a, a, an important standard vendor app and function that that has a big constituency in that company in order, in order for them to adopt your vision you're kind of making it up here i mean that you know that these these vendor silos within companies have their own advocates and influencers they have their own you know i i refer to it in the the more recent one is you know sort of a city state model they're all kind of advocating, I'm the Oracle guy, I'm the SAP guy, I'm the Salesforce guy, I'm the work, work again. We're trying to we're trying to build our careers and our influence, so we're going to try to get what they've got going. Um, the smart vendor walks into that and says, okay, well, I'm, I'm here to change your ERP, and okay, so you're running Salesforce, that's not my product. In fact, they're my competitor on the CRM side, but that makes you happy, let's talk about that. And maybe, you know, maybe, God, Willing, I'm going to show you such a great thing about my ERP and this other CRM. And the next time that CRM comes up for renewal, maybe we'll have a different conversation. You know, that that's to me the customer centric view. It doesn't happen a whole lot. Well, I think so, right? And and I think vendors have to think about a juxtaposition of two strategies. One is to expand their footprint as ruthlessly as possible, no matter what, of their own products. And the other is to become the most trusted advisor 
for the strategy that particular customer is trying to implement, right? And yeah. sometimes that mean that might mean their products, and sometimes it might not. But it means that I trust you as my go-to for your industry. And and I would say in particular, the ERP vendors have some pressure there because they're increasingly be perceived as sort of a back office relic. And, and, and their job is not just to get the ERP upgraded, but to show that they understand what the customers need. But every type of vendor, no matter what category, I think, is in this same boat. Yeah. Uh, I, you yeah, had a, I, yeah, go ahead. Oh, go ahead, Josh. No, I, I just, I, I totally agree. I think that obviously it's, it's more cute if you're a sweet vendor and you've got a breadth of product functionality. But, you know, you're a Workday or Salesforce, you walk into an organization, very often it's not just one HCM. It's not just one CRM. It's not just one process that's run entirely within your software. You've got to also play play well with others. Definitely. Yep. Just want to say quick hi to Geo Gene. I don't think I've seen you in the chat before. I know you've listened before. Welcome to the live version and feel free to chime in. Glad to have you here. Um, Thomas and Greg are having an extensive discussion on, on complexity <laughs> in the chat, uh, which, which I encourage, by the way, uh, go at it with each other. Um, there's some good points here. I'm not going to hit on all of all of them now, but I will put Greg's point is. Um, um, anyway, Greg is basically oh speaking oh. to large IT footprints. Yeah, he lives he lives that world. Uh, I want to go on, Josh, to a, a, some a couple points that came up in the comments on your LinkedIn post. One of which was from a a major ERP shop um, that said. He 100% agrees that many of the policies the large vendors adopted in the hopes of expanding their footprint are actually having the reverse effect, which is kind of what you and I were just talking about, is that the end result of that behavior is the deterioration of trust. But then uh, Thomas Welgum from ASUG made a comment, which I think is really important, which is, isn't there an API for all of this, Josh? Because I think where a lot of vendors leave this right now is, well, we have a nice set of APIs, so you're okay. What, what is your reaction to that? Sure. There's always a technological solution to it. The question, and, and yeah, I mean, every, you know, if you don't have, if you don't have an API strategy, if you don't have an ability to connect, you're, you're, you're living in the 20th century, but that's not enough. I, it, and to me, that's where, that's the difference between empathy and just mailing it in, frankly. If all you say is, yeah, okay, we understand there might be this complexity that we don't handle, but okay, just, you know, call your SI and get the, get some API stuff done. That's not, again, listening to the customer. That's not understanding the problem. They typically want more than just a technological solution. And particularly, when you're, you know, what, what you want to do in, in a world, again, of, of next generation end-to-end -end processes is you want to be able to sit down with that line of business owner and show them how their job changes and innovates and, and make that as out of the box as possible, even if that box is actually underneath is three or four different boxes. Mm -hmm. um, that's more than just saying there's a bunch of APIs and you know get someone to wire them together. You want to show how that process that orchestrates, moves through from one you know from one part of the process to the other. That's not just an AP, a bunch of APIs. That has to do with a lot a lot more understanding and empathy for the customer experience, for what the customer, the user actually is going to go through. Not just you know, it's not just a, a back end problem. Yeah, I'd like to get your comment, Josh, on Greg's point here. You might argue that hyperscalers have a vested interest in accommodating heterogeneity, more services, and differentiation of VPC processes. Services make more billings. What do you think of that? I, I'm waiting for one of those hyperscalers to stand up and say, "Hey, we're going to we'll take care of this for you." I think it's a brilliant idea. I, I mentioned you know there are ways to de the market existing market structure can deal with these. And certainly either the hyperscalers or the systems integrators, to a certain extent, they do that already. But the hyperscalers have an opportunity to say, yeah, we'll, we will give you a, that single pane of glass. I just don't see them doing it right now. I don't know. You know, somebody correct me if I'm wrong, but I've been waiting for that. And, I, you know, particularly as a cloud native lifecycle management kind of tool doesn't exist. Not that I've seen Right. And one of the things that I think is difficult is I think you need a real industry advisor to help you to sort through which aspects of your diverse landscape should remain diverse and which should be simplified and consolidated. And I think the risk you have with the hyperscalers is they're just going to say, hey, give us your workloads. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll yeah. take all of them. You know, we don't care how complex and messed up they are and how inefficient you ultimately are. We'll just send you a bill. 
Right. Um, and certainly it's in their interest not to do that. I mean, that's the problem is that it's it's in a lot of people's interest to allow complexity to remain and to allow, you know, to allow this confusion and difficulty and 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 problem to to continue continue because there's money to be made in it. You know, the moment you start and you know, so I had an interesting conversation with Unit 4 today about this when they're, they're coming out with their new ERPX and they they want to go to market with with a real vision that this stuff is built in. That we we as unit four understand that you you know we have an ERP for you. We think it's a great ERP. It may not be the only thing you run. Here's here's a strategy for doing that. I'm seeing that mentality come out more and more. I think maybe this drama I've been beating on is people. Some people are hearing about it, but it's it, it's hard to make that change. And the next phase in your argument is very interesting because what you do is you you throw a huge helping of cold water onto the idealized notion of customer success and, and how that fits into the picture here is that what you essentially say is that vendors are essentially taking this nice notion of we have a stake in your project after go live and into the future and twisting it into a means of succeeding with our products. And I just want to read from your blog because I think this is like, pretty devastating if i can actually get back and find it um let me just see if i could get there uh this will be worth it folks so just give me a minute uh one sec yes so this lack of focus on heterogeneity demonstrates a remarkable lack of empathy on the part of all these vendors this is from josh's linkedin post from a couple years ago and provides further evidence that an ethically bankrupt sales culture that favors making quota over genuine customer success has been driven so deep into the enterprise software market that it's almost taken for granted that this is how the vendors roll. That needs to stop. Boom. Boy. Wow. I, and I stand by that. Wow. Well, you know, little, I mean, look at all the, you can just go on, you know. I can go. I can. We can do this soapbox all day long. I mean, customer success. It, it, the opposite is customer failure. Look at all the deals that happen, you know, that that don't succeed. And the and at the bottom of it is is the fact that something's been oversold and something's been underdelivered. And you know, these companies unfortunately have really been marching to the quarterly drum of Wall Street, and not the much, not, the definitely not quarterly drum of customer success. It's just, you know, this is why, you know, you run into companies like Zoho who say, we're just not going to live by Wall Street's cadence. And you think, gosh, you know, that's refreshing because the opposite is I got a quota this, this, you know, this quarter and I'm going to do whatever the hell, I, whatever discount I, I have to make. I heard the other day that, you know, this, some cloud vendors are giving their channel partners a, the opportunity to make, to put in an 80% discount, to, uh, you know, in a quarter to make the, make the bucks. Jeez. What you know, that's just is an invitation for abuse and it's and it becomes abusive. Yes. And we have a comment from Sudan Shu. Welcome. Great point. Invested interest in the status quo. He's kind of getting into the solution part of this now, what to do about the problem. As with health, there needs to be clear vision and accountability of what goals and key performance indicators that will be tracked. It's funny he should mention that, Josh, because that's, that's something you have been working on for a little while. Yeah, yeah, boy, Sid, thanks a lot. You, you teed up another two-hour conversation. But, you know, fundamentally, this is about changing the concept of how do you measure customer success and what is customer success? What's the definition? And the problem is fundamentally one of accountability and transparency. You need extreme transparency in these projects in order to make sure that they're, they're, they're going the right way. And if, if you don't do that, the tendency is, again, the, you know, Got to make quota. Got to make the quarter. Da da da. You're going to cover stuff up, um, and you know the headlines are replete with, with examples of that. Um, it's you know it's it's not the the sales culture behind enterprise software is not has not been the healthiest aspect of the industry. Let me, let me say that. I'm, <laughs> I don't even know why I sugarcoated it like that. Yes, exactly. All right. <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit about what what needs to change and let's take every different constituent group and look at how they can help be a part of a better approach here. Let's start actually with customers, Josh. What do you think customers, CXOs, CIOs, managers, decision makers, 
how should they think about this in a way that can be more uh, useful to their projects and less playing into the hands of these sales tactics? Well, you know, that's a, that's a good question. There's a lot of com complex answers to it. I think that, you know, at the, at the end of the day, you know, there has to be a bigger sense of both of, of individual responsibility that, on the customer to, 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 to shepherd these process, the, these, these vendor selection, these implementation processes, these post go live processes in a way that really is designed to, to be successful and to not, honestly, not, 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 not defer too much to the partners. You need to have a real strong sense that you, while you're, you know, trust, but verify, maybe I'll use an old, you know, post cold war uh, idea. I think that the, 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 you know, the, the end user community in general, unfortunately is also part of what I call the culture of mediocrity. You know, we, I say a lot that, you know, this, this has been going on for, for years and years for my entire career. That's, that, that, that's, that's true for the buy side as well. And the buy side is a nerd, if you will, to some of the problems as well. It's just, it's been standard operating procedure. They have to change the mentality. Um, I think also, you know, they really, I think, I think the end user community in general, both on the line of business, as well as in the, in the, you know, in the C-suite specifically needs to really hold these folks accountable. You know, it's not, I want to, from my vendor, I want you to, don't come in and tell me that it's everything, every problem I can solve is wall to wall your software. Come in and tell me how to solve my problems. And I think the other, yeah, the other side for the end user community is, you know, you need to, you need to really enforce discipline internally on your people, but also on your partners as well. Vendor and the SI that's coming in there. You know, you just give them carte blanche and the tendency will be to take it to your detriment. Right. Uh, Thomas, we'll get to your points in a second. I just want to add to what Josh said. In, in my mind, Josh, I don't want to oversimplify it, but I see three big things. One is what you hit on mostly, which is customers taking more ownership and accountability for their own projects, even if they do have external partners. Um, and then the second is something I sometimes just call come up for air more often. And I would put two pieces in that. One is what we just had in the comment thread by Sudanshu around coming up with more frequent health checks and metrics around your ongoing projects and your own customer satisfaction and knowing how to measure that in a way that works for you and your organization and being able to do that much more regularly. Because a lot of these projects that unwind and eventually make terrible headlines it, it, one of the things that always stands out is how long it took them to realize that things were going crappy, you know, and, and, and coming up for air sooner certainly would have helped. Um, and, and the second part of that I think is of, of coming up for air is, is being better networked and having a better understanding of how your peers in your industry are, are, are coping with these same problems. I mean, I can't, I've lost track of how many times it shows the, the, the best times that I have are just watching customers sitting around sharing war stories and seeing light bulbs go off and me thinking to myself, this was worth thousands of dollars for you to do this. Not hearing the blasted keynotes, nothing else, but, but just having those peer oriented sessions. And, and while it's harder to do that online, it can still certainly happen. And you can do that one-on-one -on, -one on LinkedIn too. But I just noticed a big distinction between certain customers that want to be a part of broader communities and, and more that have their heads down. And I find the latter group really gets into trouble. Yeah, it, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you don't want to take responsibility, you know, it's like having kids. You want to just let the teacher raise your children. Mm, you know, they're going to educate them. That's good. Hopefully they're professionals and they know how to do a better job than you do. But you need to be in the in the game as well. And this has been what's been a little disappointing for me. Um, you know, as as you know, John, I've had this tool out in the in the industry for a while called ProQ that measures project success. It's meant to be a transparency and accountability tool, and um, a lot of people are scared of it because a lot of people, you know, as 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 horrible it is is that there are billions of dollars wasted on these projects. Um, you know, change that kind of change is, is complicated. It's difficult. We don't necessarily like. It's like I don't. I don't I take my annual physical, not a monthly physical. It's like yeah, and yeah. not that kind of physical. You know. You, yeah, exactly. Yeah. No doubt. Um, <laughs> all right. The so, annual ones are what save you. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm sorry. So Thomas says avoidance of departmental technology decisions would already go a long way. Reduction of shadow IT. That's obviously a piece of the puzzle, right? Is is proliferation of decision making as part of the challenge of owning modern landscapes. Yeah. 
Well, and, and that means that means should we talk about the other guys now? IT. You know, if IT is not aligning with business in in that proverbial way we've been talking about our entire careers, then they're not delivering what what I, what the business needs or wants, and that's a big reason why shadow IT exists. Um, Thomas wonders about enterprise architecture in this context. Well, absolutely. The problem, I, well, maybe maybe Thomas will explain this, but to me, an enterprise architect tends to be someone who specializes in one product, or at least those are the ones I know. So to the extent that that profession also takes a heterogeneous viewpoint, even if you're fundamental, you know, and I think which I think is important. If you are an SAP enterprise architect, it behooves you to understand what that means in the context of your use of, you know, non-SAP software at a very high level. So when the question comes up in the room, your answer is, well, we got an IP. If your answer is, we have an API for that, you're, <laughs> you're missing the boat. It has to be stronger than that. Indeed. And Greg just makes a comment of uh, an agility based on a set of health checks, the the agile. Yeah, Greg, you can maybe come up with the acronym of what each letter will stand for, and we can go out and brand it uh, together. Um, but but there is something to it. Um, and, and, and you said also, Greg, that's the value of the conferences that is impacted by the pandemic. I would agree with that completely, but I would also say that that's that's not an acceptable excuse for allowing these things to slack off either. Like I, I know that if you work hard, you can get some of the same experiences online, um, but it's not going to land in your lap. And and certainly vendors aren't going to provide that for you for the most part at their shows, which I've written about extensively on Diginomica.com. Shameless plug time. Um, yeah. But but um, but but you can still take your own initiative around that and form your own sort of peer groups. And and I would argue that you should because. Even during conferences, the problem with that was losing touch with people in between those shows. So you would have these revelatory conversations and then go back. And I think what's really necessary going forward is is that constant, that so-called continuous loop of like whatever. You're always in touch with people and getting those those gut checks. Yeah. Um, and, and Greg and, and, wants and, and, to ask. Oh, go ahead, Josh. You go first. Well, I was just going to emphasize that 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 is your, you know that should be part of your job. That should be in your job description is making those connections and not just living in your own, you know cloistered world. But, Greg asks, do most enterprises have the fortitude to really look at value-based IT projects and the willingness to pull the plug when one moves into the sunk cost land? Ouch. Josh, that's a tough one, man. Well, there's, you know, there's your I, culture of mediocrity, eh? Culture of mediocrity, and it, and it meets the culture of we don't measure jack. Um, the, you know, uh, the irony, I, I, I can't tell you how many times, you know, I've been asked, let's do a big ROI study in our software, blah, blah, blah. And I say, great, ROI study. Okay. So tell, find a customer who's done the before measurements so we can look at the after measurement and do the ROI and then, you know, see you later. That, you know, the metric driven life is still one that is not in, you know, is not overlapped into the professional services, into the kind of, you know, work that needs to be done. So it's hard to have that. It's hard to say, here's the value because, you know, the, clearly, right, the value is regulatory, you know, requirements. That's a value. You know, you're out of business if you can't meet the latest FDA manufacturing, you know, good manufacturing requirements, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but but the true you know I mean again I I always ask this we you you and, you and I do this all the time here we have this great migration strategy here's how we're going to do it from a technology standpoint beautiful okay now so how do you tell the customer what do you tell the customer about the value they get from this migration absolutely and and data and analytics are a big part of that and the one thing I will say and and I want to make clear that I'm not a technological optimist in in my worldview I don't subscribe to the idea that technology makes the world better as we go. But I do believe that enterprise technology has improved in many ways. And I just posted a use case on Diginomica today, shameless plug number two. Uh, it, it's uh, it, it's not a Diginomica partner or anything like that. It's just one I like from good data uh, about a customer there's TransTrack mm -hmm. and how they supported public transit companies during a pandemic. But it was all about, I, I was ready to stump this guy and say, well, what about external data sources? And he's like, oh yeah, we're making decisions based on weather data and health data and all this stuff. And I was thinking to myself, 10 years ago, I never would have heard that. And 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 so I do think, and there was a lot of discussion in that around the single source of truth and how trusting the numbers is so important to making decisions. And, and I do think we've gotten better at, at a lot of the software part. And I think in, in many cases, the software is not the problem anymore. But that doesn't mean the problem's going away, right? Because you can't throw software on top of culture and 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 data silos and 
and make it work. So, well, yeah, well, you know, software at the end, I mean, my take on this, and this is self-serving because I don't do this kind of analysis anyway, but my take is that if you're down in the feature functionality level worrying about whether you've got the right vendor, then you're really sort of not thinking about the other problem, the harder problem, which is how do you handle the change management? How do you handle the people side of what you're going to do? Be right. Very different. Oh, and Greg was referencing like a Friday afternoon video party with John and Josh. Thank Greg, you. you're kind of onto my game. I'm. I want to have a lot, a lot of fun on Fridays, but also dig into some very like gritty issues about projects because I really think that ultimately our job in the enterprise is to create better projects together. And I think we're not doing a good enough job at that. And so it's, it's time to bear down. Mm -hmm. um, so Josh, let's talk a little bit before, before we wrap up on this formal part of the sure. discussion on, on, on the role of the vendor. We talked some about this, uh, I think we've agreed that APIs are required but are not enough. Um, you made a good point in your piece, which we've also touched on a little bit, around like just being more open um, and acknowledging that the universe doesn't begin and end with your products is, is a big part of the puzzle as well. What are you looking for from, from vendors? What would constitute progress on this issue? Well, you know, I, um, I, to me, the... the, the the dream presentation is the one in which which the vendor shows me an end-to-end -end process that that spans their software and somebody else's software. In fact, not just some one, but multiple different products and how they make everybody better in the in in the way. Now, you know, I mentioned Unit Four. They're they're coming out with a new new version of their ERP. They're going to market with this idea that that you know, and and they just showed me a few slides this morning that. Really acknowledge this. That it, there it is in the slideware. If you're Salesforce, if you work there, you've already produced the slideware that says, "Here we are. We live in this heterogeneous environment." Because you can't Salesforce, particularly when you get to some of the you know the execution side, the transactional side of, of sales. You need ERP. You need all kinds of stuff. You need payroll, HR. You got to do a lot of stuff. So they get it. But even then, you know, they pretend that this is just. They pretend it's simple. I think that's. A big part of it, they pretend it's easy, um, and they sell it. You know, they sell a bill of goods, uh, and that that I think needs to stop. Definitely, let's be honest and transparent. It's hard, um, but the but the value in the in success is is very high. Yes, so Sudan so asks, uh, do you think market condition and the impact of the pandemic requires companies to transform to survive, as there will continue to be more disruption? I think. Sidanshu, you're talking about end user organizations, not vendors. Um, and I'll take a shot at that real quick. Uh, supply chains are in such disruption right now. What we just saw in the Suez Canal, fascinating, you know, story about what's what, how the old model just got literally ran down, <laughs> you know, ran up ran up on a shoal and 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 couldn't budge for you know, for a yep. very painful long time. Um, everyone is re-looking, you know, rethinking supply chains. If you try to buy a bicycle recently, you know, it's damn hard to do. Um, that's going to change, and that's not a one-time change. This is a long-standing process. We we love just in time, uh, forever. Deming and all those guys really helped us understand that's a part of the quality movement. We forgot about the, you know, the, how hard supply chains are to maintain. So, the continuous change that the pandemic has started will continue for a long time. Um, we're gonna have to really rethink how we do global business in, in, in the light of these vulnerabilities. Absolutely, I think one interesting point that we're trying to better understand is, <clears throat> you know, what will, will behavior flip back in some ways and in other ways it won't. I had a fascinating conversation yesterday with a CEO about, you know, will travel ever get back to what it once was or, well, we, you know, my hope is that we learn a lot of lessons from this time and that and that we don't fall back on this lazy idea of, oh, n wouldn't normal be great, but that we figure out, hey, you know, less travel was kind of good for the environment. It was kind of good for us, <laughs> you know, and it was great. Yeah. And, and to your point around supply chains, which I think is really interesting, which is maybe we should turn more to our local communities and look more at or, you know, whether it's organic farming or whatever it is, like, I think one of the interesting takeaways from all of this is how people have, I think, tapped into desire to be more sustainable and not as dependent on 
far-flung regions, though I think some international cooperation is obviously important. But anyway, I think it's interesting to have those debates. And if we can have them, maybe this won't be for just not, you know. Yeah. And I think, I think when you, the, the, the scratching problem is really just a, one component of a larger problem, which is at the end of the day, how do I source raw materials and deliver product to the customer? And that's, that's got to change. That's already changing because the consumer side has been rapidly changing forever. Um, Absolutely. And, <laughs> Maureen doesn't see a whole lot of rethinking happening in the world. Oh, well, John and I are rethinking. And it sounds like you We're are. We're trying, Maureen. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Maureen. I think Maureen, uh, let me just make a vague prediction that Maureen may have more to say about this at a future edition of this show. Well, let's just leave that hanging for now as a little bit of a teaser. Uh, by the way, Richard, Richard Perro, uh, probably butchered your last name. Sorry about that. It'd be great for a software company to actually sell solution versus software, but Richard, they've been selling solutions for a long time now. Haven't you kept up with the marketing literature? Come on, man. Yeah. Come on. We're selling solutions all the time, but no, it's, it's a great point. Because there's, yeah, there's, you know, and I would say success, let's sell success. And, and, and by the way, customer, you tell me what your definition of success is. Let me help you achieve that. Now, you don't want my definition as a vendor. I got, I got, I got investors. (laughs) They have, they're bothering me about this problem. So Josh, what do you, what do you think about this whole like impact of, of, of blogging has, has, has the blogs that you've done on this, do you think, has it just been more of a cathartic spleen vent or like what effect does it have? <laughs> have you been able to like take it forward in, in some way? The cathartic spleen vent. That's brilliant. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing traction. You know, I, I, you know, I've been a consultant. We've been, we've been doing this for a long time. And I always say, you know, the first, the hardest thing about being a consultant is to have permission to even say something. There's a lot of people with a lot of good ideas. Being the person that they'll at least say, what's your opinion is great. The miracle the true miracles when they actually take some of that advice and, and act on it. And I think that that's, you know, I'm starting to see that. I think what you, I saw from unit four, I'd like to think is, is today is certainly part of that thinking I've been seeing in, in a lot of vendors product descriptions. Now it's, it's hard to change that sales culture that's down at the bottom in the field, you know, trying to just make quota and, you know, with what they got. Um, so I, I, don't know, I was ranting there. I missed. I missed what looked like a good exchange because someone. Uh, uh yeah, people uh, just commenting. It's good. It's <laughs> nothing to really shift the focus at the moment. So, so do you think of a blogging as an important component of your research? Because you, you also wrote a really good piece on the loneliness of the independent analyst, but <clears> of <throat> uh, folks like yourself and me that aren't part of the big shops. Which, by the way, if you want a little good humor about the big shops, check out my April Fool's Day um, video with Brian, where we announced a competitor, the quadrants and the waves of the world. That was yesterday. Uh, yeah. If you want, I can post the video link if you didn't see it. But uh, but but for for us, Josh, we don't do these quantitative research. So so h- how is it that you sort of do you know? Okay, I've had enough customer conversations. Now it's time to put this out there is that kind of how your process works or well you know it's it's uh, the, the good thing about being an independent right is that we can sort of pivot onto the onto the big ideas as, as they emerge so this is one that's just been really you know i just hear all the time i hear it i think i mentioned it you know that, that you know that there are these advocates these these siloed advocates in, of, of a particular vendor inside inside a customer want help with this and want to have us you know and so, you know, eventually, eventually, yeah, the critical mass builds and I got to just spill my guts somehow. I don't blog a lot, but when I do, you know, um, and that's a big, we can have a long discussion about what is influence. I think this stuff has been influential. I think it's been, you know, you've been amplifying it and you've been talking about this as well. I think together the, you know, this, this zeitgeist is starting to really emerge as, as real. Look, at the end of the day, this is where it's going to go. Whether it happens now or later, these vendors are going to have to get more empathetic. They're going to have to get more in, in you know, on the customer side, and not on the investor side. You, you, you can you can try and pretend this won't happen, and and it won't until you're steamrolled by the folks who get it, um, because that's the next evolution. You know, look, look at what look at what the Japanese automotive industry did to, to car manufacturing in the United States. Nobody, when I was growing up, I'm an old fart. Nobody thought a car should last 100,000 miles. That was an, unless you were tinkering it with yourself by yourself. You, that never happened. Things change now. You buy any old car, and if, if it can't hit 100,000, then you you know that manufacturer has failed, and they know it. 
these, this is where we're going to go. We're going to get to the point where that relationship has to go 100,000 miles in the customer. You have to go that 100,000 miles in the customer's shoes and, and get it right. I, I laughed and, and appreciated in the LinkedIn version of your piece where you hit on the myth of account control. Because I think so much of this comes down to this illusion that we have, especially in the software world, that we can control the destinies of what happens in our so-called ecosystem, to use a word that I... E ecosystem, feel, did you say? E oh, ecosystem, as Vinny Merchandani yeah. sometimes yeah. calls it. Yeah. But I, I laughed when I saw it because I was thinking about how vendors should have tried to control people like you and have always struggled with it. Um, <laughs> and, and, and you. <laughs> well, yeah, right. Okay. Um, and 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 I think like that's the whole thing here is that stop trying to control that which you cannot and and start thinking about the fact that what does that mean that I can't control this anymore? Like and and how does my behavior need to change as a result of it? You know, like I said, it's in you know, there are certain inevitabilities. Um, and this, you know, this empathy issue, this customer success issue is gonna happen. And yes, um, you know, and that's it. So what are you gonna do? Again, are you gonna be you're going to be on the train or you're going to be get, get run over by the train. Uh, guys like John and I, we can help you get on that train. That's, that's, that's what I try to do anyway. Yeah. Um, Richard, a question, Richard says a question that underpins this conversation is around what will happen. What will the source of disruption be for software companies? It is very dif difficult for companies in the established industry to disrupt themselves. Yeah. I, I think that's true to some, to some extent, Richard, but I do think that, that, that having a hard listen to the needs of your customers um, can can be very important here. And the one thing I would say is that the software market continues to evolve. I've had some interesting conversations of late around this notion of legacy SaaS, which is this thing around that the SaaS model is getting kind of old in some ways. And in many ways, it's repeating the same games, which, which uh, if you want to see my video interview with the scorching interview with Adam from Upper Edge a couple of weeks ago, uh, where he deconstructed the sales practices of SaaS companies, um, you know that that's just kind of part of the puzzle is is customers awakening to this reality that maybe this isn't maybe maybe lock in is still a really serious problem for me and maybe I'm not really getting what I need from this I'm getting more modern software but I'm not necessarily getting a better experience a better business relationship a better result and 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 what I would say Richard is that if 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 this, this generation of software companies doesn't deliver that it does create an opening for those that will. And, and so I think we're going to continue to see that as per Josh has mentioned today and mentions in the chats of some upstart companies that are growing right now that are trying to do things a little bit differently. Yeah, no, no to me, so I was just uh, talking to a, software, a couple of software execs with our friend Bonnie Tinder from Raven Intel about this exact problem. How do you disrupt the software industry? Well, I got an answer. We got an answer. You know, you disrupt it by, by going after this issue of transparency and accountability. By stopping, don't pretend that I've got 97.5% customer set because everything's beautiful. But actually say, as a matter of fact, this stuff's really hard. And, you know, you're probably going to, you know, we're all going to struggle together. But we're going to make sure that every time we do a project with you, we're going to learn from it. We're going to improve it. We're going to make sure the partners improve. We're going to put this transparency and accountability out front, and that's our disruption. That, to me, would blow a lot of you know a lot of minds out there because that sure as heck isn't being done now. All those customer success execs don't do that today. Yeah, and uh, Sudancha says many sexy SaaS solutions that have great UIs are forcing the legacies to improve the front end. I would agree with that, Sudanshu, but I think to a large extent, in my opinion, that's already happened. And and I think now some of those sexier SaaS solutions are being disrupted by 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 cloud companies that are trying to do things fundamentally differently. And you know, we, we mentioned like Zoho and the fact that they're privately held. Zoho is a Diginomica partner, so I don't want you to think I'm doing this like for that reason, but because it came up earlier. Um you know, companies are doing things dramatically differently. So, for example, simplifying contracts. There's a, an ERP company in the mid-market that, that, that charges based on consumption-based usage for the most part. Flexible licensing. They've also published a bill of rights. I'm not going to mention them because they're also a partner. And I don't want you to think I'm just pushing our partners. But the point is, um, there's going to be a lot of change. And, and I think a lot of that change is going to be not about pretty UIs, but about a deeper 
promise of a better way of doing business and a better way of doing projects. The one thing I will say is SaaS companies have reduced the cost of implementation to consulting, which has been a huge problem with like legacy on-premise software. They've done a pretty good job of that, but that's a cost reduction thing. That's not a business transformation thing. So. Yeah, and it, and it's not you know that I think there's you've traded one set of problems for another. Um, yep. And the marine, hundred percent. Thank you. Keeping humans in the loop. Let me know when she shows up on the show. I want to be there in the front row. Yeah, you know, Marine, I, I don't know. I think I think an intelligent blockchain powered post sale support system with a uh, highly highly automated interactive chat would work would work awesome. Yeah. Um, <laughs> sarcasm is uh, you know, oh my goodness. Better, yeah. There was this thing in the I added to our thing yesterday when we were announcing our 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 technology trap is like where I said, you know. Vendors think that CIOs care about fair fairness and diligent vendor evaluations. They don't care about that. They want they want us to put all these vendors through an AI powered review and post it on a state of the art blockchain. That's what they want, you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you can get me frothing at the mouth about blockchain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jo Josh is um. I think Josh might have even harsher feelings towards blockchain discussion than than I do. By the way, Josh, blockchain talk is formally banned on this show. You might appreciate oh, good. that. It's actually a rule of the show, um, but but obviously, like us, this is an exception because we're satirizing and not putting it forth as an actual solution to real. My my, my favorite oh. example, I have a friend who's a climate law um, expert, and he sent me one recently about a bunch of um, carbon credit people. They want to they want to track carbon credits with blockchain, and if you know the carbon footprint of blockchain, to right. try to track these offset offset credits using the most hideously, you know, embarrassingly, uh, uh, you know, uh, carbon, you know, carbon killing technology possible. Oh, my God. You know, it's just, I, yeah, my head starts to explode. So. Yeah, it's almost like a circular pattern, right, of the blockchain measuring its own consumption until it, like, ultimately spins into infinity and self-destructs and takes us or, down with it. Or we get on one of those exploding rockets that that uh, Elon Musk has to get the hell off the planet. We just burn to the ground on blockchain. Yeah, yeah. I've always wanted to ask Musk if it might be worth saving our planet, also. But I guess that's. The topic. I think a lot. I think when you get that rich, you, you you realize it's probably not worth it. Let's get the hell out of here. It seems to be a lot of very rich guys want to get off the planet. Yeah, Greg. Greg, I'm not really worried about the the, the blockchain messing with me, but. We'll see. I've been writing a little bit about NFTs. Yeah, I've been writing a little bit about NFTs and and hits and misses, but uh, that's a little bit of a different thing. Um, that's more for like, you know, can can visual artists find a way to to like make a living online? Which is, I'm not saying NFTs are a solution to that, but it's a different problem than the enterprise problems. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, yeah, we'll talk about NFTs some other time too. Yeah, I don't think I don't think you and I are the right, and I don't think we have the right audience for it either. Well, Josh, I promised you a half hour and I made you stay stay late. I'm sure you have other stuff to do. So Yeah, it's Friday afternoon at almost two o'clock. And yeah, I got a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I'm, I'm glad to have you on and, and to be able to share some of your views. By the way, folks, I have a prior podcast with Josh that goes into deeper detail on what causes project failure. So if you want some more of Josh, um, check out my Busting the Omni Channel podcast archives. And you can hear, I think we were huddled in the bowels of some convention center. We were, we were down in Vegas. Yeah. On the yeah. Floor. Yeah. Trying to get the guy uh, changing the window to stop making noise. Oh yeah. I remember that. Yeah. That window guy was like not, not respecting our podcast environment at all. It was. Yeah. Wow. Harsh. I was like, Do you know who we are, man? No. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, no, I'm cleaning these frigging windows, man. Yeah. I, I think, yeah. Anyway. I got to move yeah. these color TVs money for nothing. Yeah, uh, yeah. Blockchain is waiting me. Thank you, John, for having me on board. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, fun. Josh. You can go ahead and sign off. I'm gonna shoot the sh shoot the sh shoot the shit with these chatters for a few more minutes. Okay, great. Thank you, everyone. You later, man. And attention in the questions, and uh, catch you next time. And that's it, folks. Uh, anything you want to talk about? In uh, oh, oh, Thomas, we missed you, one of your questions. Sorry. Talking of pricing, how do you think vendors can be enticed to charge for value delivered? Not for usage or similar. Well, you know, it's a it's a really good uh, really good question. 
I mean, outcome-based models have gotten some traction, but unfortunately not nearly enough. I don't have a really good solution to that, actually. Uh, but I, I do think, Thomas, that the best solution for competition is more competition. You know, um, The vendors that get the laziest are the ones that think they have the market cornered. And that's that's why it's such a problem in the large enterprise space because it's harder and harder to disrupt the incumbent vendors in in, in large enterprise contexts, in, in my opinion. So um, anyway, um, but but you and I can do our part by trying to put forth more varieties of solutions and different considerations, and uh, you know, an end to golf course relationships is how I sometimes describe it. Uh, we should take this out to pasture permanently. I, I realize that's a naive goal, but hey, it's Friday. I can dream. A guy can dream. So yeah, folks, I've got some interesting guests I'm working on for coming weeks. So I'll try to keep keep the variety coming. And, uh, and I'm sure I'll have uh, Brian back on as well because Brian was so full of vinegar in his uh, deconstructing cloudy RP benefits slideshow. We're definitely going to have to see what other slides he has in the works. Any final comments or questions or suggestions before we wrap up? Otherwise, we will catch you next Friday. Greg, I don't know what a self-portrait NF NFT will go for today, but I would just say, you know, throw it up on eBay and see how you do um, and report back. Absolutely. I'm watching the chat for any final comments. And five, four, three... Two, one. See you guys. Have a great Easter weekend. Laters.